Hi, everyone. I'm Casey Ullenhut. I'm a product manager uh, at Databricks. And I'm Lindsay Maiko. I'm the head of data science for Providence Healthcare, a um, large West Coast based not for profit healthcare system, 50 plus hospitals, tens of millions of patient visits. Um, I'm in the IT department, so I have platform responsibility to support the enterprise. We have a federated model with data science and AI. I also build full stack vertical solutions, which I'm really excited to talk about today. So a lot of our customers at Databricks are trying to figure out, hey, what should they build with generative AI? And then how do they get ROI out of these use cases? Lindsay, I think you uh, have sort of dived more into the like, hey, how can we use Gen AI to build new products. So can you kind of walk us through what you're doing at Providence Health with generative AI and kind of what's like the most strategic use case that you all are working on there? Yeah. And, you know, for, for context, the portfolio is pretty big, um, but I'm going to tell you about, I think the most interesting, the one that I like the most. And I think that when all things shake out might have the biggest impact. Um, so um, the use case starts with our Institute for Human Caring, um, led by a palliative care doctor. Um, doctors, clinicians get about 15 minutes of training to deliver end of life news um, to families and patients. The actual conversation takes 20 minutes to an hour. So you can tell that's not enough training. Uh, it's bad for patients. It's bad for the physicians. And so for some years, we've had a program to train people on how to have these difficult conversations. The problem is we have tens of thousands of clinicians, caregivers, as we call them. So we just could never scale. Like we literally, we were hiring actors or we would pull clinical staff off the front line and have them play the role. They would be their coach. We could just never train everyone the way we, the way we needed to. Um, and recently, based on some really fascinating and emerging research that shows that Humans seem to really like the way AI communicates around like medical issues. Like we find AI empathic, which is a little bit surprising. Um, we started to build an AI-based training and communication coaching platform where people could learn and practice these difficult conversation skills for the core initial use space of palliative care conversations. And part of what I love about it is that. You know, well, so we have a we have a working, you know, beta or first version. It's in testing, people are starting to use it. There's tons of feedback. And what we quickly saw is that large language models don't behave the way humans do in those conversations. We fine-tune them to be very pleasing, to be verbose, to communicate like everything all at once. And so we actually have to unwind some of that. And so the cognitive architecture that we've developed is highly agentic. Um, has dynamic prompts that update as you flow through the graph of the conversation and requires RAG to be inserted at um, specific points. The, yeah. um, the value is obvious for palliative care. It's like saving money in actors. It's also making us better people. But you can imagine there's a lot of other things you have to train workers on. Um, difficult performance conversations, diversity and inclusion, diversity and pronouns. There's a wide list of use cases that provide that just like for automation, as well as upskilling, as well as like the mission driven for the most of the Right. Time. Yeah. Cause that's like a, it's like not just augmenting people, but it's also like helping make them better um, themselves. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's what I, that's what I love about it. I mean, we do need to save money. Healthcare is money for the situation for not the profit. But so that matters. But like the core is to be better. What we found at Databricks is many of our customers are really struggling to get to quality. Like getting quality Gen AI apps into production is hard. And so many of our customers are finding ways to sort of embrace data intelligence. So by using their enterprise data to improve uh, general intelligence to achieve quality, or they're using compound AI systems. So rather than shipping like one monolithic model with like maybe like a huge prompt on it, you're actually breaking it down into like modularized components where you can like specialize each component. You know, I think when Gen A launches, it's so easy to prototype something in chat GPT with one prompt, right? You you're, you just think if you can tinker with your prompts a little bit more, a little bit more, like right. you get to the, the, the outcome you want. Um, a key lesson for me is that that's an evolutionary dead end. Um, you know, don't tinker with prompts and they'll sleep, think like comprehensively design the system and like, the, the sequence of events that need to happen to deliver value. I usually think that is a graph. 
And is this because you find modifying the prompt becomes too unwieldy or is like too unpredictable? Well, or what's led cool. you to like yeah. move from that yeah. to thinking? One that you can get such wild swings in behavior by changing one word in a large prompt. Like as an example, in the empathy use case, when we said you are a patient, 45 years old with knee pain named Lindsay, like that generated like very unrealistic behavior. When we said you are a professional patient named Lindsay, we just inserted that one word, suddenly they started talking in a way that made a lot more sense. Because professional patient is a term of art that you'll find in like Reddit or something like that. And like that unpredictability and that kind of like like variance, right? As you're kind of basically like kind of pointing the attention heads at something else so wildly, like I don't like the trial and error bit of that. Yeah. Also, practically, I found that like, I, you know, I'm a leader, I want everything fast, and I want it like awesome. And so I found that my teams were too slow, like they would just get in the cycle We're like, Oh, it's not quite there. Let's tinker and then let's come back next week. And you get in this cycle. And so we were doing AI engineering in a kind of like, uh, kind of freeform way rather than doing it in the way we would do software engineering or data engineering, where you have specific criteria at each step of the way, you're, you're testable, like you know when you're done and then you move on. And you can also apply other like prompt development frameworks like DSPY or something like that, you know, right. kind of treat, treat the development in, you know, the normal way we build software. I think what's kind of interesting about your case is you're like dynamically changing the prompt mm -hmm. to like the patient agent, right? So you're like adapting it as the conversation goes on. So can you tell us a little bit about, so like how you architect and like what, what's like an example use case yeah. uh, through that architecture? So um, the fascinating piece of doing the design and we just spent like an all, all day on site is to design the AI architecture. We had to, we had to think cognitively. Um, I'm a neuroscientist originally. So I was like, it was great to go back to the well. So we were talking about things like, like, how do you express, like, um, you know, um, acknowledgement of someone's emotional state? How do you understand it? Like, it was like, that is not a thing that we would normally be talking about in a technology development session, but we had to discuss it, put it on a graph, and then define some quantitative criteria. So for this patient agent, they have a, like, a medical history. They have a demographic history, like age, gender, location. They have some permanent characteristics, like, you know, they're um, they're very obstinate, they're very self-directed, and they have transient characteristics, like they're um, they're nervous, um, they're they're sad, um, you know, they're talkative. And it's those transient characteristics that change through a conversation. I think that's intuitive to people. Like you sit down with someone as you become comfortable with them and they acknowledge your emotional state, you'll open up, we'll tell them things. Or if they're mean to you, you're going to start responding in different ways. So the and psychological characteristics are what update as you flow through the conversation. Um, and critically, that's where agents, like kind of one of the places they step in is they're, they're evaluating like the conversation on both sides. And they're looking to see where the doctor has um, like expressed in a positive way, you know, like an understanding of the patient's emotions, and then the trust can rise, and then the verbosity can increase. And so that's just on a mechanistic level, that's an updating of the system prompt. Um, there's also an agent looking to coach the doctor that has access to the internal state. So it can stop the conversation and say, hey, this patient's getting really angry. They haven't told you yet, but inside the temperature is rising. You might want to rewind the conversation and try again. And then Lindsay, I think like the challenge that you were mentioning that you will run into is that off the shelf models are basically all tuned to be as pleasing and like nice as possible. Um, and so like, why does that present a challenge for uh, you and like what you're building with your patient uh, AI and your, your conversational coaching? I mean, so the, the, the dynamic prompting is like, is a, is a tactic towards that, you know, like, you know, be, be verbose, don't be verbose. Right. And it needs to change based upon expected, like, you know, um, you know, behavior at different parts of like the, the flow of the conversation. Um, I think that, um, 
you can also look at it from a different dimension and be like, this is an obvious fine tuning problem. Um, there, there's like two reasons why we're not taking that approach. Um, although it makes total sense technically. One is that like, we also are highly regulated and like, we can't use, like, we can't use technology to tell GAs, uh, and then there's still a long cycle of friction before we deploy. So we're super excited about Mosaic too, and definitely want to use it and fine tune open source models to be mean to us. We just don't have the approvals yet. Um, um, but also like- Let's not make that our tagline though. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, but what I love about it is like there there are unintended I'm I'm you know like there are unintended consequences to well intended solutions and yep. there are use cases for which you need an LLM that is toxic and those are weird but like they do exist um, yep. and um, and this is an an example of it um, the other reason is that we don't have a big training corpus like physicians know what these are supposed to feel like we have like a vibe right but like we don't have like thousands of examples of like really good interactions or really bad interactions that we can fine tune against. And we absolutely can't pay doctors to sit there and read a bunch and score a bunch. And you can't outsource it to mechanical turn. Okay. So okay. we had to some degree take the knowledge in a clinician's head and translate that into like some formal design and then translate that into like, um, you know, features and stories that we could, we could engineer and LLMs provide a different path to value. Um, uh, where as in previous machine learning, we're like, we had to be 95% accurate, 99% accurate. If you can automate 10% of a task, like only be right 10% of the time and like sh decrease the queue that humans do work 10% of the time. And you do that thing across 10,000 workers, that's huge. The ROI is monstrous. And so for those struggling to get value, things don't have to be perfect the way they used to. They can actually be pretty mediocre and still have huge value if you have the scale of a like large corporation. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here and we're excited for what you build next uh, on Databricks.